I want to share with you a question. Do you know that there is one desire that is guaranteed to be satisfied? Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Sounds good to me. What, what really is being promised here? My definition of righteousness is mature love. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says, love hopes all things. Love carries hope for the loved one. Hope is dreaming of and expecting an excellent future. Mature love, righteousness, cares for and hopes for and desires to bless the loved one. The Good Samaritan is an excellent snapshot of what mature love looks like. So with this definition of righteousness, we could say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for mature love. Blessed are those who long for a deep caring, large hope, and spiritual gifts to bless those they love. They will be satisfied. For several weeks, we've been looking together at the life of Peter. So here are some questions to consider for the next few minutes. What dreams, what hunger in Peter's life made him keep following Jesus? How will what we see in Peter's life influence our dreams? When Peter denied that he knew Jesus and realized what he had done, it says, Matthew 26, 75, he went out and wept bitterly. Why? It could have been easy to walk away. He could have said, the Jesus I know is powerful and in charge. Now that I see him like this, I realize I don't even know him. He could have walked away and started his life over again with little grief. There was a reason why it was hard. Peter loved Jesus. He admired Jesus and wanted to be like him. Peter hungered for righteousness, so his failure was a bitter loss. Here's what interests me. Jesus knew that Peter would fail. He knew that Peter would repent. Jesus knew that Peter loved him and had a deep hunger for righteousness. Peter, Jesus also knew that the righteousness Peter hungered for required him to live in touch with the Holy Spirit at a level Peter had barely begun to explore. With that awareness, Jesus used every moment of Peter's painful experiences to help him make his best dreams come true. Let's watch him do it. In Matthew 16, 16, Peter had just declared to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You can tell Jesus was eagerly looking forward to this moment when his disciples began to hear God for themselves. He responded, Peter, you did not figure this out for yourself. You know that I am the Christ because God himself told you personally. You received this understanding by revelation. I imagine Jesus going on with hardly time to take a breath. He's explaining what is now possible because his disciples are receiving revelation. Verse 18, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. A gate lets some people through and not others, or it only lets people go one direction and not the other. If it was built to stop everyone, it would be a wall. If everyone was allowed to go through, the, the gate wouldn't be there in the first place. Gates control who goes through. The only way the gates of hell could prevail against the church is if hell is holding people the church is called to set free. So we can begin to understand the excitement of Jesus in making this announcement. On this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
Through ongoing revelation, the church is built on the rock, Christ Jesus. This well-built church becomes able to handle the keys. Then the church is given keys to the gates of hell to set the captives free. I don't believe this is just about our final destination. This is now. Jesus is handing out keys to release people from their suffering in this life. Here's an example of the keys being received and used. I'm thinking of a time when I was struggling. I, I was not able to get the full benefit of salvation. Someone who understood the importance of forgiveness asked God to show us if there were others I needed to forgive. As we waited together, I began to get some awareness of who I had not forgiven. The person praying for me also got some awareness of what needed to be prayed about. As we went through this experience and I repented as God showed me how, I was loosed and set free to go deeper in my relationship with God. I, I could not have gained that freedom without the keys God was providing through Revelation. So, Melissa's going to like this one. Take your bulletin and, uh, and, and look at the important part, the back. The Mount Vernon Seventh-day Adventist Church mission, setting people free in Jesus. So how do we even begin to receive Revelation. We start in the same place Peter started. Peter declared, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. When Peter said this, he showed that he was starting to tune in. He was thinking thoughts that were inspired by God. But he didn't know it. Jesus had to tell him. Peter, you did not figure this out on your own. It was revealed to you by my father in heaven. Notice what happened a few verses later. Verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of man. Peter heard from God about who Jesus was. Then he took all his preconceived ideas and theology and joined it to that revelation. His theology had room for a victorious Christ, but not for a suffering Christ. So his next move was to come directly against God's plans. This new revelation, guided by his preconceived ideas, working directly against what God was trying to accomplish in the moment. Peter did not know that he had moved away from hearing God and was listening to Satan. Jesus had to tell him. Here's the problem as, Peter, as Jesus explained it to Peter. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Our hearts can easily be occupied with our thoughts, our expectations, our plans, our hurts, even our fears. These things can get in the way of hearing God. Learning to hear God is an ongoing work of repentance. We must receive God's correction and healing for all that is hindering his word in us. This moment of revelation in Peter's life came after he had already spent years hanging out with Jesus day and night. He had already been out healing people, casting out demons, healing the sick. We're seeing that after years with Jesus, Peter was just starting to catch on that he needed to be tuning into God for himself. It's okay to be beginners in this. One time when I was obsessing in my hunger and thirst for righteousness, one of the elders helped me understand. He said, you can't simply choose to be at a different level of maturity than where you are. I didn't want to hear that. I was the guy that at four years old was placing a step stool in front of the toilet. I was going, I'm going to be tall soon. I have to learn to hit the toilet from way up here. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. <laughs> Go 
growing up can be messy. And it may take longer than we want it to. Sometimes, rather than start at the beginning, we, we try to begin hearing God during some important decision or crisis. People who have no, not practiced hearing God sometimes want to start by asking God, who, who shall I marry? Or what career should I go into? Starting small usually works better. Then the surprise can be when you discover one day that you can hear God on the important things as well. So here's a way forward. Take time to be alone with God and his word. Make your Bible reading and worship and interaction with God. Ask him to guide your attention to the places in the Bible he wants you to focus on. As you read, keep asking him your questions about what you are reading. Listen for the answers. Ask him to show you the moments throughout the day when what he is teaching you applies. In this way, make your whole life an interaction with God. What I want us to see today is Jesus is sharing with Peter his excitement, his dream about what the church was to become through hearing the Holy Spirit. Peter got it. In his turn, Peter wrote, sharing his excitement, his dream about what the mature church would look like. So let's hear it from Peter. This is a reading condensed from 1 Peter 1 and 2, the Message Bible. I, Peter, am an apostle on assignment by Jesus the Messiah, writing to exiles scattered to the four winds. Not one is missing. Not one forgotten. God the Father has his eye on each of you and has determined by the work of the Spirit to keep you obedient through the sacrifice of Jesus. May everything good from God be yours. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What a God we have. And how fortunate we are to have him, this father of our Messiah, Jesus. Because God raised him from the dead, we've been given brand new lives and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. God is keeping a careful watch over us and the future. The day is coming when you'll have it all, life, healed, and whole. I know how great this makes you feel, even though you have to put up with every kind of aggravation in the meantime. Pure gold put in the fire comes out proved pure. Genuine faith put through this suffering comes out proved genuine. When Jesus wraps this all up, it's your faith, not your gold, that he will have on display as evidence of his victory. You never saw him, yet you love him. You still don't see him, yet you trust him. With laughter and singing. Because you kept on believing, you'll get what you're looking forward to, total salvation. The prophets who told us this was coming asked a lot of questions about the gift of life God was preparing. The Messiah's, let, the Messiah's spirit let them in on some of it. That the Messiah would experience suffering followed by glory. They clamored to know who and when. All they were told was they were serving you. You who by orders from heaven have now heard for yourselves through the Holy Spirit the message of those prophecies being fulfilled. Do you realize how fortunate you are? Angels would have given anything to get in on this. So roll up your sleeves. Put your mind in gear. Be totally ready to receive the gift that's coming when Jesus arrives. As obedient children, let yourselves be pulled into a way of life shaped by God's life, a life energetic and blazing with holiness. You call out to God for help, and he helps. He's a good father that way. Your life is a journey. You must travel with a deep consciousness of God. It costs God plenty to get you out of that dead-end, empty-headed life you grew up in. He paid with Christ's sacred blood. 
It's because of this sacrificed Messiah whom God then raised from the dead and glorified that you trust God, that you know you have a future in God. Now that you've cleaned up your lives by following the truth, love one another as if your lives depended on it. You've had a taste of God. Now like infants at the breast, drink deep of God's pure kindness. Then you'll grow up mature and whole in God. Thank you, Peter, for sharing your excitement about the church. I'm starting to get it. I'm catching the dream of a mature church that can open the gates of hell and let people out. I want to see with my own eyes and experience with my own heart the fulfillment of God's promise because Jesus dreamed of a mature and capable church and because Peter dreamed of a mature and capable church, I dream of a mature and capable church. I know what I want, I hunger and thirst for righteousness. I have a dream. In my dream, our hearts have become so broken by the needs of the lost and suffering around us that energetic prayer flows out from us as naturally as water over a falls. I dream that people among us are so passionately in love with Jesus, they become like Mary who poured perfume on Jesus' feet. They are willing to risk what others consider public disgrace in order to reach one goal. They spend their lives and themselves to express how good they find Jesus to be and welcome his love more fully. In my dream, we do not embarrass these people for their creative exuberance. We're not embarrassed by their uninhibited displays of affection for Jesus. Instead of taming them, we invite them to be our worship leaders. I have a dream. I dream that we have become able to see the potential in each other. We can see the king in young David, the shepherd boy. We can see the apostle in Saul, the persecutor. We can see in a profane coworker a humble disciple of Jesus. We can see in scheming, conniving Jacob, one who can wrestle with God and prevail. We can see in those we are tempted to call pew warmers a tenacity that will not stop short of the very throne of grace. We are aware of the ways of God in bringing people to maturity. Out of that awareness, we can see spiritual gifts, calling, and destiny emerging in each other's lives. We encourage each other intelligently to develop our uniqueness for the kingdom of God. We see each other with eyes of faith, but we know the decisions to reach our potential have not yet been made. So seeing each other with eyes of faith spurs us on to passionate intercession, to pray in all that we can become. I dream that church has become a place of dreams then no young person is bored in church because our young sons and our daughters prophesy and our young men see visions. I dream that we know by experience what Jesus meant when he said, power has gone out from me. In my dream, we know by experience what Jesus anticipated when he said, he who believes in me as the scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. I dream that Christianity is no longer torn apart by denominational barriers or any other kind of alienation. Our shared love for Jesus unites us in fellowship even though we sometimes disagree. In my dream, every denomination has taken its place of leadership in the arenas God has called them to explore, but that does not stop that uniqueness does not stop anyone from learning from those called to explore other arenas of spiritual growth. I dream that our fellowship has become a setting where God can bring his wounded soldiers. He can bring us a child who is daring to hope that God is fun to be with. He can bring us a teenager whose difficult questions about right and wrong have been glossed over with shallow moralizing. He can bring us a young person who wonders if God is big enough to deal with a world that is unimaginably cruel. 
He can bring us someone whose family has disintegrated after, after years of claiming every promise in the book. He can bring us a modern-day Job who is bewildered and scared because God seems to have turned his back. He can bring us addicts whose compulsive efforts to escape their hopelessness have only compounded their despair. He can bring us leaders whose failures have humiliated themselves and their followers. In my dream, the Holy Spirit has supplied so much compassion, wisdom, and healing among us that all these people can be healed and their destinies restored. I dream that Christianity has become the force for good described in Isaiah 61, where it says, they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Even the revelation of how good God's plans are for the church is one of the keys. Do you understand how much is at stake in this matter of the keys? The church Jesus dreamed of, the church Peter dreamed of, and the church we dream of depends on receiving the keys to open the gates of hell. I want to repeat a story that, uh, that Rosella has told that illustrates this perfectly. Pastor Ron, her husband, was working with some ministers in training, and they were inviting a young woman to accept Jesus and be baptized. She was refusing, but would not say why. So Ron took her back to 1 John 1, 9 and read, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness except for abortion. She answered, does it say that? No, it doesn't say that. Okay, I'll be baptized. The other ministers were amazed and asked Ron later how he knew. He, he did not know. He got it by revelation. God handed Ron a key. He received the key and used it, and a woman was set free from hell. Amen. Don't be intimidated by this. God is not surprised by the fact that we are beginners. That's good news. It means we're free to enter into the messiness of this exploration. We may get mixed up at times, like Peter did, and find ourselves listening to our own fears or even to Satan. Just like he did for Peter, God is committed to helping us learn to sort this out. God does not shame us in our weakness, but he is calling us to grow in our awareness of his presence and in our experience of hearing his heart. The church Jesus dreamed of, the church Peter dreamed of, and the church we dream of is waiting for us to mature. Take courage, we are entering this journey having Jesus' personal Guarantee of success. The guarantee sounds like this. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be satisfied. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your love and the many ways that you express it. And even though we know so little of the future we are facing, we know we have a good God who will walk us through this. Lord, teach us to hear your voice. Teach us how to live life with skill and maturity, constantly in touch with your spirit. We love you, Lord. We love the ways you have led us already. And we're enjoying building this relationship with you and getting acquainted with you more deeply, learning to hear your voice and hear your heart. Thank you that you are committed to teaching us and walking us through this. In Jesus' name, amen.